Thank you. <laughs> a lot of people here tonight. Um, well, it's my distinct pleasure to sit here with uh, Professor, I'm just going to call her Arlie because I can't pronounce her last name. <laughs> I'm having a hard time with that. Um, but um, not, to, not to put you out there too much, but I read her stuff when I was an undergrad, so I've been, a, been, admirer, right been admirer for a long time. Um, so anyway, so welcome to our conversation. And, um, you know, her book, Strangers in Our Own Land, um, Clearly a landmark book. I mean, it's really well read. It's extremely well written. Had a chance to read it uh, on the plane a couple of weeks ago for the first time. It's really worn out right now. But I, I did. I learned a few things. I mean, I. So what? I hope what Arlie will say is that, you know, she learned something from my book too. That would be very oh. nice. <laughs> and so we just his we just, came out first too, by the way. <laughs> so he was on top of the game. I it, just confirmed him. And we just and we just came at it from different, you know, methodological perspectives. She's a more qualitative researcher and I'm more of a quantitative type. And it's always good, you know, in social science when you have this um, when you have this conversion, right, using different methods. It certainly gives me more confidence in, in what Matt and I found and hopefully, you know, yeah. it confirmed what, what she found as well. That's true. You want to say, you want to yeah. say anything in a way? Oh, I'm delighted. <laughs> Absolutely delighted to be here. And uh, just uh, loved your book Thank and, you. and uh, felt that, I mean, we, we really found the same thing. I just dug deeper into one yeah. place and yours was more the overview. So. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure we'll find something to disagree about, but. <laughs> well, I, you know, given the time we spent in the green room, you know, I thought you know, we have actually less to disagree about than I thought, so. But, you know, we'll try to give you guys a good show, so. <laughs> So, um, so I'll begin with a, with a few softball questions. You know, the, so the pitchers will start up at about 70 miles an hour. They'll get to about 100 by the time they get to the bottom of this tablet. <laughs> so, so let me ask you first, Arlie, like, what's the purpose of the book? <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, purpose of the book actually shifted on me a bit. Um, in 2011, I had a moment in the sociology department in my office at UC Berkeley and uh, in this kind of blue, blue, blue bubble and realizing that uh, there was a big split, that, I, that so many things that I wanted to see happen and I've written about over the years weren't going to happen. Uh, if nobody believed in government, if the government said being part of the problem, not the whole part of the solution, not the whole solution, but if people didn't see it, if they saw it as the enemy, oh man, that nothing could happen really. So I thought, I better, I better look and see what this is, this growth of the right. So that was the first purpose. You know, so what's going on? I don't get it. And then this, what I realized is that nobody I knew kind of knew anybody <laughs> who was really hardcore Tea Party either, and that I was in a bubble. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I had to get out of that bubble and just turn my alarm system off. You can do it. <laughs> you can turn it back on. <laughs> um, and try and climb an empathy wall into another world, another truth, people who live in a different truth. And so that was the first purpose, but after five years of ethnographic work and going to pig roasts and <laughs> eating a lot of um, uh, fried food <laughs> um, and uh, going fishing with people and hanging out, looking at graveyards and schools, go to church, um, and coming back and writing this, I have sort of a second purpose because I wrote this before Donald Trump became our president. Mm -hmm. And my post-Trump purpose mm -hmm. <laughs> is to try and find solutions and to take, to speak to uh, 
depressed audiences <laughs> and get them active. That's my second purpose. So, so, so one of the things, well, first of all, I want to just say right straight away, I refuse to call that man my president. He's number yeah. 45 as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, let me say, let me just follow this up, and it just occurred to me just now when you just said, so you used um, uh, ethnography, right, um, which I, I don't really, it, it, basically, do you want to explain what ethnography is? I mean, we've got a whole bunch of smart people here, but for those people who, you know, haven't gone to grad school, can you explain that approach really quickly? Yes. Um, if uh, you're an ethnographer and you're really interested in finding your best, deepest answers to something, uh, what you do is begin by reading a lot of quantitative work so you get a lay of the land. You guys actually read our stuff? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> read my book, you find a lot of quant work there. Um, but if you're a person like me, what you learn by getting up close to somebody, really up close and getting to see how they feel about things. And that is how I learn. For me, each person is a book, as complex as a book, and as interesting. And so I have to get up close. It's, not everybody's like that, but that's how I am, and ethnographers are. And so you try and climb into their life. And what I did, for example, um, I'll give you an example. Okay. Um, once I was, I had this red state paradox in mind of how the poor states and the worst off states in every possible way, lowest life expectancy, everything, take more money from the federal government than in aid than they give to it and in tax dollars and revile the federal government. I, I went in with my question and that was it. And Louisiana, which was this heartland of the South, I thought, okay, perfect. This is just where this is the strongest, so I'll go there. And then it turns out to be Lake Charles in the Southwest is a petrochemical center of chemical in, in, uh, industry where um, the pollution is the 1% worst of the entire country, very second highest cancer rate in, in, uh, uh, in the country. And they don't believe in regulating polluters. So I thought with my alarm system off, perfect. <laughs> this is what I don't get. So with that in mind, here's how ethnography worked. Um, I had five different strategies for getting around about over those five years, but one of them was to go to meetings of the um, Republican women of Southwest Louisiana. And they have a gun raffle. <laughs> so start with a prayer and the pledge, the gun <laughs> raffle. And then we're <laughs> eating our gumbo. I knew I wasn't in Berkeley, California. <laughs> um, and so you're sitting around with eight uh, people, women, uh, and uh, one of them said, uh, Madonna, her name was, um, I love Rush Limbaugh. Mm. Mm. So I had my little empathy wall moment. Uh, <laughs> I thought, holy sh**. And I'm, oh, <laughs> I'd really love to talk to you about that. <laughs> And um, so, should we meet for sweet teas? Yeah, so tomorrow, sweet teas, we're meeting, and she's explained to this. I, I explained to everybody, look, I, I'm Mary Poppins. <laughs> I dropped out of the sky from Berkeley, California. Berkeley. <laughs> oh, you communist? <laughs> um, so, uh, and I would say, uh, yeah, and I'm worried about the divide. You'd get a head nod, okay, the divide. And then, um, uh, and I feel like I, I'm in one bubble, but you're in another, and so I'm here to write a book about your bubble. And people say, okay, y'all come, okay. You set them straight. You know, they, <laughs> your people don't understand us, and they think we're all backward and, and prejudiced, and you, you, 
You set them straight. That's all right what I <laughs> no promises were all right. But um, uh, they, so I meet Madonna and I ask her, well, so what is it about Rush Limbaugh that you like? And oh, he is my brave heart, brave heart. So about what? Oh, he hates feminazis. And I thought, I hope she hasn't Googled me. <laughs> <laughs> Second shift. <laughs> uh, but um, she, uh, it, 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 you know, and so I'm listening. And I'll ask her, well, what is a feminazi? Oh, it's a hard, cold, tough, you know, hates her kids, me first kind of person. I thought, whoa, I don't like that kind of person either. Um, um, and actually, privately, I thought it's a little like Ayn Rand and you know, these um, iconic books of the right. Um, but so I'm listening, and um, then, uh, well, what else do you like about him? Oh, he hates these environmental wackos. Well, what's an environmental wacko? So I'm like that, you know. Um, and then she said, I know you don't agree with me. Mm. Is it hard for you to, to hear mm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, she's watching. <laughs> and I said, actually, to tell you the truth, it's not hard. I have my alarm system off. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not here to tell you about me. Mm. I'm here to learn about you, and you are really doing me an enormous favor, mm -hmm. uh, for which I'm very grateful. And I'm, I'm learning a lot, I'm already learning a lot. And then she said, oh, I do that too. I do that with my kids, I can turn my alarm system mm -hmm. off. And I do that with my parishioners. She turned out to be the wife, she's a gospel singer in a Pentecostal mm -hmm. church and her husband, mega church, 700 mm -hmm. parishioners, mm -hmm. and he was the minister. And so she, uh, so I do that, and, and so we, okay, so you know what I'm doing here. And then she said, you know why I really like Rush Limbaugh? I said, you know what? Really, the truth is, he protects me against people like you. <laughs> <laughs> <gasps> Who think that we're backward and stupid and, uh, and uh, racist, sexist, homophobic, and fat. <laughs> um, she was a large woman, um, but she uh, was an extraordinary singer. She invited me to her uh, church, and at the service, her husband, there was on a Thursday, uh, the, the plants empty out on a Thursday around seven o'clock. So they waited till five past seven and all these parishioners that had been, uh, that are workers in the Sassol and Philip 66 and, and uh, are sitting there. And her husband said, oh, we have with us today Arlie Hosh Hosh, <laughs> 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 who's come to find out how we Southerners think. And then I thought, my 700 people, mm -hmm. you want know, the ethnographic mm -hmm. sort of luck is what it was. They came up, oh, people say, oh, are your folks anywhere near Stockton? You know, we get in our <laughs> camper truck and visit Ken. So a lot of people, that was one way that I did. But that's how I learn mm -hmm. is close up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So another question I want to ask, um, I want to ask about two concepts that you introduce in your book, keyholes and line cutting. So can you please elaborate on why you, what is a keyhole in this context and why you chose environmentalism as a, because I can think of a, several other keyhole issues, if you will. So why For environmentalism sure. as your keyhole issue? Because I was, uh, I had read What's the Matter with Kansas and the whole issue of self-interest mm -hmm. came up. Is this really, uh, the candidates that you're voting for, is it in your self-interest mm -hmm. to do it? Mm -hmm. Well, 
that interested me, and in a pragmatic way, I thought, okay, this would be a way to find, this way to reach people, actually. I could get them that we might not agree on, on other things. Mm -hmm. We won't agree on race, mm -hmm. but I, I, I get them this way. Right. <laughs> so in a way, I was, and in a conversation, you know, don't you want to live long? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, becomes quite a basic question. How could you be, I know you love hunting and you love fishing and you love nature and you, you love your children and your kin and they're dying. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I chose that. You could say there's some pragmatism. There's, the, yeah, because I wanted to ask you because clearly like race would be the obvious keyhole issue. Yeah, but I thought, oh, I, I, I get knocked back. I didn't think so. Okay, so you thought you would get a better reception by approaching it through the environment. Not just reception, but I thought that um, they could maybe see it my way um, <laughs> 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 on, that, <laughs> on that issue. I mean, uh, so as a starter issue, you could say there's some pragmatism. It was a starter issue. Okay, because that was the first thing I thought. I'm like, in the environment, like, I'm thinking, like, given everything that's going on, especially based on the research that Matt and I did on the Tea Party, like, you know, race was a huge part of it, but it wasn't just limited to race. It was sexism, uh, oh, xenophobia, yeah. all these, all these oh, other yeah. things. Um, but we're going to get to that in a few moments. Uh, I, actually, right now, with the line-cutting metaphor. Yeah, well, here's, here's the thing. I listened to them talk, and I thought, what do I have here? There's a stack of attitudes that people are telling me and I'm absorbing. And as an ethnographer, what you are is really a sponge. And then you go home and you try and put it together and think, uh, okay, what's this adding up to? And what, for me, the a basic approach was feelings. What are people's feelings attached to? How do you form a symbol? What is a symbol? When do things really feel hot and bothered? And when do you feel like it, that's you that's been destroyed or you that's been elevated? Um, I got very interested in feelings and all my work has had that as a kind of a focus. I'm a social psychologist, really. And so I thought, actually underlying those attitudes is a deep story. And they've got theirs and I think we've got ours. I, but the deep story, what is a deep story? You take facts, clean on out of the deep story. and You take moral ideas out of the deep story. It's just what's left. It's what feels true about a salient situation. So, I, I, what is their deep story? What do they feel about something really important? And what came up was that they felt, and you tell it like a dream, you know, or in, in a language of metaphor, that you're waiting in line, uh, as in a pilgrimage, and you face the top of the hill is the American dream, and you feel like you you deserve that dream, and that you've worked hard for it, and you actually feel that you don't begrudge anybody. Isn't that interesting? Just nope. pause on that one. The, I'm taking you inside a, a You're taking me inside southern white people's heads right now? Is that what I, that's that's just that? what I'm doing. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Well, but yeah, pause okay. for a bit. Okay. Okay. That's okay. just what I'm doing. You can come right on back. Um, but, okay. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But the feeling is of innocence. It's important for us to know this, I think. We're really going to be effective in this political moment. I mean, we have really lost big time. This is so serious. And we have to know, I think, what we're dealing with. And so, deep story uh, is a fence sense of, uh, gosh, the American dream is there. And uh, they hadn't had a raise in two decades, and so the, and the line wasn't moving. And then in another moment of this, 
deep story. They're line cutters. Well, who are they? They're blacks who, through federally mandated affirmative action, um, I was on the affirmative action committee at UC Berkeley, by the way, <laughs> and am a, 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 a beneficiary of it. Um, so blacks uh, and then women, even worse, 51% of the population. Are, so blacks now have access to jobs that have been historically reserved for whites, and women who now have access to jobs historically reserved for men. And then immigrants, uh, uh, undocumented. And for them, uh, even the oil-soaked brown pelican, Louisiana's state bird, you know, goes waddling up and sort of, it's cutting in line. And they said, oh, the environmentalists uh, oh, put animals ahead of people. They're animus, you know, worship animals. So, um, and refugees, you know, seen as cutting in. And then another moment of the deep story, and here's where I think your book is, is, is really important here. Barack Obama seems to be waving to the line cutters. Oh, he's their president. Oh, he's the president of the line cutters. In fact, isn't he a line cutter himself? Many people tell me over and over again, how did his mother, a single mother, afford a Harvard education, afford a Columbia education? I could never do, nobody I know could. This must be rigged. So then it goes, you know, no such thing as, as scholarships for brilliant students. It, it, it's, it, they go to a rigging place. And then, um, so he, then they began to feel, well, who am I? I'm never going to get ahead. They're not looking in the back of the line. You know, they're just looking forward. And no history, <laughs> too. There's an erasure of history. And then they feel a, a kind of final moment of the right-wing deep story that someone from the West Coast, let's say, someone highly educated, let's say, someone like me, let's say, uh, or you, I'd say, uh, turns around, they're closer to the American dream, but turns around and says, you ignorant, Bible-thumping, ill-educated, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, redneck. And for them, that, that word, uh, that word um, is uh, the ultimate insult, you know. I've worked hard and so on. So that is the, I think, the, the right-wing deep story. Mm -hmm. And it's as uncomfortable as it is, I think it's important mm -hmm. to kind of just see what that feels like and then to see how the distrust of the government derives mm -hmm. from that. So, would you, so you would say then that the distrust of the government sort of goes through this idea that their hard-earned tax money is being redistributed to people. Can, we, can I make that inference at least, that that's part of the, their problem? Yes, that's okay. right. That's okay. right. By the way, after doing sort of uh, developing this deep story, I went back to people. People say, oh, you read my mind, yeah, oh, I live your metaphor. And others then would say, no, no, you don't have it quite right. Um, because the line waiters, uh, the waiters in line are paying taxes to uh, support the people who are cutting in line, and the government has been the author of this. So it's kind of affirmative action gone amok, mm -hmm. is, is the short version. So were there any, so were there any uh, so two things. So what were your findings ultimately? Like what did you ultimately conclude? <clears throat> and beyond that, were there any surprises? Oh, wow. Well, um, let's think. Uh, the deep story was a discovery for me. I didn't know they felt that way. Mm -hmm. I didn't know why they felt the way they did. But so. Uh, wait, wait, wait a second. Let me press you on that. Uh -huh. Did that change the way you felt about the people or the types of people you interviewed? Did it, so did you go down there with one, so we all kind of know what it's like to be a social scientist. You have, one has to be objective, right? 
Um, but when you are conducting these interviews, I mean, you're a human being, right? So you're sitting there in front of these people and you're hearing their story. Yeah. So, and so I would think at some level, you know, some emotion, as hard as you may have tried, you know, had, had to register. And maybe, and sometimes it was empathy, sometimes maybe it was um, disdain, yes. right? Yes. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to, I, in the long run, trying to ask is, is, did it affect, did you go down there with one sort of frame of mind Right, and when you return to Berkeley, it, it, it wasn't the same. Wow, that's a really deep question. Um, doing this work was hard, uh, and there were times I thought I can't talk to this person. That, there's one person that's not in the book, I just couldn't, couldn't manage it. Uh, mm -hmm. Racist, mm -hmm. racist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I can't climb the empathy well here. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. And one part uh, toward the end of this research, uh, Donald Trump came uh, for the primary rally in New Orleans, mm -hmm. and I went to that rally with a Tea Party uh, member, mm -hmm. and it was six hours in the <laughs> car. <laughs> and you know, where she was talking at me. Because, you know how some people don't want to have their views challenged, and so they fill it up with words, you know, like cement. And, and uh, so I, I, I had to receive words for six hours. Mm -hmm. It was hard. <laughs> uh, it's not easy, all fun, nice people. They are, some of yeah. them. Yeah capable of great empathy and maturity themselves and complexity. That was, you asked for surprises, I didn't <laughs> expect that. And so, you know, I developed emotional respect for certain of them, very much so. But this woman, that was, yeah. So it's, it's uh, it calls on your capacity to be patient, but uh, toward the very end, I have to say, I had a flight reaction. I just, I was staying with one of them and I, I just couldn't get out of the fast <laughs> I think Once I saw Trump, I thought, oh man, I'm in deeper than I thought, whoa, yeah. And we're gonna get to uh, Trump here in a few moments. I know that's what, one of the things a lot of people came to hear, like how does this feed into the current political moment? Um, and I just wanna alert you guys as an audience, so we're supposed to have 45 minute conversation, we're getting ready to bump up against that real soon. And so the balance of that was supposed to be devoted to q and I just wanna let you know, I'm cutting into your Q&A time probably, okay? <laughs> just, just wanna let you know, it'll go from 30 to maybe 20 minutes, so. All right, so, uh, so, the, la so one, the last thing on, the, on this first uh, bank of questions I wanna ask is, where does race fit into the deep story? Oh, big time. Uh, I think it is uh, really at the basis of the deep story. That is the first line cutter. Um, and it was so interesting. Race was all over the place, just physically. I mean, if you just looked at the names of, you know, uh, at the, of, the, of the parishes and uh, the of the banks and the freeways. And actually in one of the people that I met uh, who was an environmentalist and I had asked him, can I, he said, oh, I have a lot of friends who hate what I do. I said, can I follow you around and meet the people who hate what you do? Uh, which was really, it took me into central Louisiana. He lived in the back of beyond in the yeah. woods in Longville. And he said in 2010, uh, there was a cross burning. 2010, mm. not that long ago in mm. Longville. Mm. Uh, and uh, there were some road workers, there was road repair and they wanted to, they had a camper truck or, or a, uh, uh, a unit that they sat down that, on the ground to to live in while they were there so they wouldn't have to commute. And uh, so uh, there was this uh, burning. 
and federal troops came out and arrested uh, the men, six men. So, yeah, race is, is, <laughs> is really there. It isn't, see, one of the surprises too is that it wasn't race as I expected it though. There were some surprises to it. I was a civil rights worker um, in 1962, this is before you were born, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, in Vicksburg, Mississippi, my mm -hmm. husband and myself. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a difficult year. There were three civil rights workers murdered that year. And uh, uh, then it was just so blatant and just so clear and uh, people would yell epithets at the house where we stayed, uh, nigger lover and so on. So um, I never encountered those whites there. I was working with blacks and uh, so, uh, but I got a sense of the intractability uh, uh, of this and the clarity, as I imagined, in their minds of this. But when I, um, this is what's interesting about Charlottesville. I went back after Charlottesville to say, let me check out race. What's, what's the deal here? Mm -hmm. And what was really fascinating is that um, after this, these events of the KKK with the torches and the Nazis uh, uh, and uh, the murder, uh, all of that, we then saw our president uh, say there were good people on both sides. And then we saw this master tweeter spend 48 hours without tweets, <laughs> tweetless two days before he responded to the uproar that his first inadequate response uh, led to. So we are in the hands of clearly um, a racist president. So I went back, what did you think, I would say, of Charlottesville? And uh, the answers were that big grimace, oh, it's terrible. They should, they're, they're mean people, they should, they're awful people. This, what did you think about the president's response? Nah, he's good, you know, we like Trump, but nah, like that. So I thought, well, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, surprise one, that you have a racist president who is dog whistling to his, quote, racist base. I am talking to the racist base, and they are saying, no, this, this sullies our cause, this, this is, demeans us. We don't want to be associated with those races. So I think, oh, this is not like 1964, uh, Freedom Summer, very different. But this is how it gets complicated. I said, well, oh, so you don't, You're like, no, no, terrible. Because it, um, uh, it, it, uh, sullies the American flag to have uh, white nationalists, we think they're terrible, and it sullies, surprise to the Confederate flag. <laughs> so I go, whoa, this is dizzy, you know. <laughs> uh, and that's what this work is like. There's one surprise after another. So what did that mean? Well, then you would get a story about, well, the Confederate flag, that's not associated with slavery. We love Martin Luther King, we hate slavery, but the, but the, the Confederate flag just represents the South. And then I'd say, represents the South, okay. Often one of my strategies was just to repeat what the last thing they said, as if ingenue, I don't quite get it. And, um, they would say, uh, yes, and then there, with a lot of them, there was a flurry about the different kinds of Confederate flag. It, different kinds of Confederate flag? There are different kinds of Confederate flag. There's early Confederate flag and a late Confederate <laughs> flag. There's the, there's the, they said, a battle flag and a non-battle flag. There were some, a 
plethora of flags. So I thought, what's going on here? It, it was an attempt, I, my interpretation, to cleanse mm -hmm. the idea of, um, of their history of the South. And they would, so it was as if racism, as I had understood it, had kind of, it, it, it was, you put it anti-coagulant in, in, in the cultural bloodstream of the South. And these things that I thought cohered and were solid, you either were or you won't, they had divided them into little narratives, each with its emotional punchline. Like, oh, I didn't, you know, my family was just poor whites. We never owned slaves. Well, what is that? Why are they telling me that? What, they're, they're telling me that because they don't want me to guilt trip, as they think all liberals do. So, um, and that would be the same person who um, didn't like the white nationalists, didn't want to be associated with them. So, I guess what I learned, you asked what the surprises were? The surprises is I, I didn't expect it to come in this form. They are for Trump and they are threatened by black line cutters and women line cutters. So putting it all together, you can say, yes, this is racism, but it certainly didn't feel anything like what I expected based on my 64 exposure. So, so in your, in your afterword, however, um, that's not, when is, when is your uh, a new paperback edition going to be published? Just out. It's just coming out. So it's out, out there? Yeah. So out. your afterword that you after sent me is in that book. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the question I wanted to ask is, is that, you know, I, and I read the afterword and, you know, they were, I know what you're saying here, but they were a, a little more explicit. I mean, I drew the conclusion that, you know what? These people are kind of racist, right? Well, not even kind of. I'm saying that right now. Yeah. But if I were in yeah. private with yeah. folks, oh yeah. man, I oh yeah. But I'm saying the conclusion I drew: these are some straight. These are straight up racists. They're trying to rationalize, yes. as you just said. Yes. But I still one can draw the conclusion, however, that mm -hmm. these people are racist, right? And so, and that's kind of what I drew from reading your your afterword. But that that's not what you're saying right now. So can you? I'm saying it's things. racism in a new form. It's, it's, and that they care what the rest of society thinks. I, when I was there in 1964, I don't think they cared at all. Now there's this effort to say, no, I'm not a racist. They were terribly afraid that... Well, so they wouldn't believe in what we call a social scientist, so they wouldn't admit to what's called old-fashioned racism, this kind of stereotypical racism, right. but yes, it's more right. consistent with what scholars have been talking about for 30 years, a sort of new racism, the fact that their belief that black folks, you know, violate cherished American values, hard work, individualism, mm -hmm. and all those things. Would you say it would fit within that framework? Yeah, I would. Okay. New. Okay, yeah. new racism. Okay. So, well, I got to skip past a whole bunch of questions, so let's get to this here. Um, so, so, so one question I want to ask is, is that, you know, we had this discussion in the green room and, and, and also when I read the book, when I read the first part of your book, and most people that know me know I fucking hate the economic anxiety argument. Can't stand it, right? Because it just doesn't work, right? That dog won't hunt, that dog is dead, right? So, and the reason, and the reason why I say that, <laughs> thank you, and the reason why I say that is that Matt and I found that in our, you know, our Tea Party book that, that this sort of perception of economic anxiety failed to impact at all their support for the Tea Party. And then when we move forward to Trump, right? So this idea that you know, Trump won because of working class whites. I mean, I think all of us kind of figured that out now, that that's not the case. Um, you know, how can one say that you know, he benefited from, you know, the working class whites made the difference when it was, as a matter of fact, he won 48% of college educated whites. Now, I'm not saying that some of them aren't economically anxious, but come on, let's keep it real here, right? College-educated whites, I, I don't think that they're economically anxious. And even in the green room, you were telling me that you were dealing with the, what did you say, the elite of the... The elite <laughs> of the left behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, when you think about who the movement, uh, who, who are the people that start movements, 
mm -hmm. uh, on the left or right, they aren't the abjectly poor right. often. Right. They're right. one up from that's that, right. and that's, that's right. who these people are. That's right. That is, that is to totally right about that. But, let's, but, let's, but one of the questions I also want to ask is, and this, is, this will get to the point at which we're talking about how do we move forward, right? And what's the solution here, if there is one? So how do these people differ from, I mean, are all conservatives the same? Like, I mean, are, oh. are these people all of a piece with, you know, conservatism as we know it? Or can we sort of separate these folks out? Because when we were talking about possible solutions and we agreed on this, I didn't think we would, but we did. And it's like there's about 20, 25 percent, probably even 30 percent now that Trump is in office that will not budge, right? They are not willing to compromise, right? They are these what are called, what, I, what Hofstetter called back in the day, and I wanted to ask you about the paranoid style, but we're not going to have time, um, that the, uh, the late Richard Hofstetter, this uh, historian at Columbia, wrote this very famous book, among his other famous books, called The Paranoid Style in American Politics, and he's talking about essentially what we're talking about right now. And one of the things he said was, so like most people think about fundamentalism, they associate it with religion of some kind, right? It doesn't have to be associated with religion. Fundamentalism is just strictly an old school way of looking at anything, right? Fundamentals of football, baseball, basketball, right? It's a very old school way of looking at things. So he called these people secular fundamentalists. And I tend to think that these are the same kind of people. So and in and, and our research, Matt and I's research and c continuing research, what we find is, is that a cons an establishment conservative will tolerate change, right? As long as a change is is somewhat productive, you know, they will, they will embrace social change if it is productive, right, but they won't, but, but they'll embrace it only to the extent that it won't lead to revolution, right, so they prefer evolutionary, slow, organic change to revolutionary change. That's one of the reasons that, you know, that's one of the things that Edmund Burke wrote about way back in the day on the French Revolution. If that the ancient regime had made some concessions, they wouldn't have got this revolution. And so, and so I think Present day establishment conservatives kind of feel the same way. Whereas these establishment types have, excuse me, these reactionary types have a more Manichaean worldview. It's good versus evil. That's why it's so easy, it's so difficult for them to compromise. They see compromise as capitulation to evil, right? And so what I thought when I read your book, I, these are the same people that I'm seeing right now. And that's a question, that actually should be a question, I should have, I should have problematized <laughs> that, right? <laughs> so is that, do you see those kind of people in your interview subjects? I see both. I would mm. say um, if, if there, uh, some were Manichaean, as you mm. describe, and I thought, whoa, this will be very hard to make any, um, any common ground on, on issues. And um, we should, understand who they are, but move on, right? That it wouldn't be productive use of our scarce, precious <laughs> political time. Uh, there was, for example, at the Trump rally, there was a man uh, who, who said to, to nobody in particular, there are thousands of people, and is there, big rally, very excited, and he said, oh, to be in the presence of such a man. <laughs> wow. So uh, there, I, I felt, and I've written about this elsewhere, op-ed in the Boston Globe, that really, while Trump has violated virtually every moral precept of the religious right, he tapped into a kind of belief in the rapture. Mm -hmm. and you can do that, you, it, that's the paradox. Mm -hmm. And this man saw him as uh, being raised up in a secular rapture. Oh wow. So, <laughs> so you're not gonna have a crossover talk with that guy. Okay, right, right, <laughs> right, right, right. Which, 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 which leads into this, uh, my penultimate question. Where do, so like, will these kinds of people always be around in your estimation, right? And, and so answer that question first, and then follow up is, um, where do we go from here? Like, what is the, what if anything is a solution? Okay. Um, yes, maybe there will always be such people. Uh, 
but I think it's a huge mistake for us to say, Trump is a racist, yes, Trump is a racist, but all of his, the people that voted for him are also racist and deplorable people. I think uh, that's a big mistake. I, uh, because, and your own work I think would, would bear this out, there are different types of people. These, these break down into different types. So where I think we go from here is, uh, is, is this, we I think should get out of our depression and our confusion, get active uh, because we are faced with a, uh, a moment so momentous that it's hard to know what to compare it with, the Civil War itself, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. It's really serious and we, we, we have to devote time and attention to this, all of us as good citizens. It's my own personal mm -hmm. uh, belief. And that there are four important pillars of activism. The first, in lots of different ways, address ourselves to the uh, importance and defense of the principle of democracy, checks and balances. I think that these uh, pillars are being kicked at, the whole independence of the press and the independence and legitimacy of uh, a judicial system. Um, so that's the first thing. You don't need to talk to anyone you don't agree with in doing that. Second is uh, to reformulate the democratic platform and to get candidates, really, that uh, speak to the um, issues that are on um, a lot of people's minds. And, <coughs> and make people feel acknowledged and be the, the party of the unifier you know, and be the, the party of patriotism, actually, and the Constitution. Why can't the Democratic Party, the party of the working man and the working woman, be the party of unity and democracy? I would love to see that. That's pillar two. Again, you don't have to talk to anybody that uh, <laughs> uh, feels they're being taken up to heaven and so on. Um, <laughs> pillar three is to get the vote out and your own uh, work on that uh, shows that voter turnout is enormous. So, pillar three. And again, don't have to talk to people that aren't like you. But pillar four, and these are in order of importance okay. in my view. Okay. One, two, three come first. But in addition, I think, uh, and coordinated with the first three pillars, we need a fourth pillar that will help us actually with the first three, which is to reach out to certain subgroups um, in the Trump camp. And I think of what is by some estimates six million and by other estimates eight and a half million people who voted for uh, Barack Obama in 2012 and then switched to Trump in 2016. I think you could have some very good conversations with this group, and it would be a mistake to smear them and s sneer and say, oh, well, you voted for him, I'm giving up on you. Mm -hmm. And the uh, one uh, out of three, you would know this better than I, but it's either a quarter to a third of white voters who would, who voted for Trump, but would have voted for Bernie Sanders if he had been the candidate. I found a lot of liking of Sanders among these super right-wingers. Wouldn't that be an interesting conversation? So I think pillar four can strengthen the work going on in pillar one, two, and three, and we need to be coordinated um, as in a loyal opposition until the next time we get to vote. Yeah. So can I? <laughs> so so I just want to say a couple things before we throw it up into Q and A. 
So yeah, you're probably right that all people that voted for Trump aren't racist, but if we think about this probabilistically, if you get two people, one's a Trump supporter, one's not, probability is higher that the Trump supporter is going to be a racist than the other person. Yes. So, 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 true. so, so that's kind of, I mean, I've, I've heard people say that and I have no doubt that that's true, but I, it's just hard for, I, speaking from where I am as a black man in America, it's just really hard for me to have sympathy for those people. So mm -hmm. let me just mm -hmm. say that right off the top. Yeah. Um, so um, another thing is, I think those, I think what you were talking about, the platform for the Democratic Party, I, I'm doing some research right now that suggests that a class-based approach is not going to work, right? It's not going to get people of color out. It will not work. We saw what recently happened in Virginia and Alabama, right? And so you got the Democrat Party needs to scare the base, right? Forget about this positive economic, I know this is, this is your show, I just, I just, I just want this little piece right Go here. for it, because, go for <laughs> it, go for it, it's your show so, too. So, and I just, I just, research suggests, and I, I just, I just don't think that is going to work, right? A clear economic message, that's not gonna work for people of color. They tried that the first time this was tried, trying to coalesce people around class, across race, happened with the People's Party of the late 19th century. White planters came in, played the race card, done, right? We essentially, as black people, were written out of the New Deal, right? That's another time, right? So I'm just, I'm very skeptical about this approach working. But we saw that, you know, the identity politics play out and play out well and redounded to Democrats advantage in Virginia and Alabama. Now, whether or not that can be sustained is an empirical question, but I think we should at least try that approach. Um, and third, I do believe in the framing things as patriotic about an appeal to American identity. I think that a more durable, like you have these establishment conservatives that I mentioned earlier, they are more likely to put country before party, right? I show that in my own research. Other people have shown that in beginning research. That sort of framing actually works. And a durable coalition, I think, can be fashioned from framing these uh, progressive policies in the context of American identity as who we are. May I ask you a question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Reverend uh, William Barber II, mm -hmm. I've, I've heard him uh, mm -hmm. speak in New York and was blown away. Um, of uh, South Carolina, he's the Moral Monday Moral guy, Carolina, yeah. and he has uh, organized 30 cities and on next Mother's Day uh, to have uh, demonstrations for poor children across the U.S. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Um, I think, I mean, I, look, I'd rather have those demonstrations than not, right? So I think, I think, it is, I think it's a good thing, right, rather than them not happening. But I just, when we start, when we're talking about politics, I'm just saying the whole class based, in theory it should work because race and class are so tightly linked together, right? right. We are in the class that we are, generally speaking, as people of color because of our race, right? right? right. So, so in theory it works, it's just in practice, it just does not work. There's a, um, a principle that he's following, mm -hmm. uh, which is that uh, that we're stronger if we have the moral high ground, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Moral high ground. He's mm -hmm. not saying, oh, politics, you know, let's just get out of the way. He's saying, no, we need the moral high ground. Mm -hmm. And he gave uh, the sermon in the Riverside Church on the anniversary of Martin Luther mm -hmm. King's uh, get out of Vietnam uh, speech. And he's a crossover guy. He's saying, he's not just saying race, race, race. He's saying this guy of, you know, war and let's be uh, all poor children. And he's very clear about wanting the moral high ground mm -hmm. as a way of inspiring people. Mm -hmm. um, well, he inspires me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I think he'd be good for the Democratic Party. I'm not saying he wouldn't be yeah. good, but, but I just think the class-based approach just class-based, just, it's just not going to work. But you don't think it's morally inspiring for him to... Oh yeah, yeah, I just, I think it's morally inspiring, but I just don't think it'll work. <laughs> so, so let me... So, okay, that, so, yeah, okay, so that's... So we, we just have to agree to disagree on that. Yeah, let, okay. let me just throw one last, just give you guys one last thought before we throw it open to Q&A. So I'm sure most of you know what um, uh, 
Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail was, right? Uh, written in 1963 after he was jailed um, uh, during uh, a protest. And one of the big takeaways from that, and you know, you were you, you're like, this was like part of your mix at the time, so I'm, I'm sure you remember. And one of the things he took away was, one of the things I took away, and that I, it's been confirmed, is that you know, he really was trying to get at the clergy and white moderates, because he knew he wasn't going to get the racists. He already knew he had the white reformers on his side. It's the white folks in the middle, right? And it's the same thing right now. It's the white people in the middle that can make or break this. We are at an inflection point, people, right now. We're at an inflection point. Things are either going to get a whole lot better or they're going to get a whole lot worse, and it's going to happen, but it's going to happen really fast, right? So you guys, if you guys aren't active, as Arlie said, you guys need to get out there and have your, register your voices, make them be heard, right? This is no time to sit on the sidelines, you guys. This is absolutely no time. It's either put up or shut up, put your money where your mouth is right now, you guys. People, mm -hmm. we really gotta do this. Yeah. So let's throw it open to Q&A. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, you wanna go first? So, um, <clears throat> my name is Atusa, I really enjoyed uh, your conversation, it was really inspiring and I was live tweeting it. So, um, I wanted to ask you guys both a question. Um, you come at things from slightly different uh, ways, but what I'm understanding, if I may borrow one of Professor Parker's phrases, is that we have to communicate an existential threat to this uh, swayable or convincible or, or inspirable group, which is this eight and a half million or whoever is right. like somewhere in the middle and might be brought to their senses. How would you go about doing that on a daily basis for us? You know, if we're not in a position like you are with your voices, you're in this high position of, of influence with your voice in the sphere of politics and the sphere of education. We maybe are not, maybe we, we know a lot of people and talk to a lot of people, how would you go about communicating that in a way that doesn't turn them off and make them feel responsible for Trump being in power, but inspires them actually to open their eyes and start walking the path uh, towards this, these pillars of activ activism? Wow, wow, great, great question. Um, I think that um, uh, there is a movement, actually, that is under the radar uh, of different groups that uh, come under an umbrella group uh, called the Bridge Alliance. And there are 80 different organizations with funny names like uh, High from the Other Side, or <laughs> <laughs> both sides. The um, a co-founder of moveon.org, Joan uh, Blades, uh, is a mediation lawyer, and there are hundreds throughout the country now. Um, and I've teamed up with her, and, and I'm doing this. I'm part of this, this thing. And um, there's a talk going on. Um, join this. Join Indivisible and join uh, one of these groups and see if you can find a way to target this eight, eight, eight and a half million, one of those. But there, uh, I was just on the phone with the head of the Bridge Alliance. He's a retired guy from Penn, uh, uh, Penn State. And uh, this is growing, so I would, I would do that. I would do that. I would get out the vote first. I would defend, you know, pillar one, two, three first, but mm -hmm. uh, that's how I'd engage pillar four. Definitely get out the vote. Um, one of the things that, um, that uh, my colleague Matt Barreto and I show in our forthcoming book is that if you change, if we change the turnout of peop just people of color by 0.78 percentage points, then Trump loses Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin just by not even a whole percentage point, right? And so, I mean, people ask like why, like why didn't people of color turn out, you know, in, in higher numbers? Um, and the, the answer is kind of complicated, but to simplify it is that, you know, most people of color, I'm, you really didn't take him seriously until now. And second, you know, there were a lot of people, especially in the black community that weren't really high on Hillary Clinton. So you couple these things together. A, they don't think, they don't think you know, the Cheeto's gonna win, and B, 
Um, they didn't, they're not too crazy about Hillary Clinton, and so, you know, they just weren't that enthusiastic. Now, let's think about it like this in terms of the existential threat thing. So, when we, so what we found out in, in Alabama, um, the special election, uh, which Warren Roy Moore lost, black turnout was at 89%. Now, to contrast that, with the high water mark prior to that was 2012 with Obama, it was at 67%. Or Obama was 67 percent. All right. So I think okay. there is there's a, a model. There. There's yeah, a model there's for a you. there there with this existential threat stuff. How did they make it happen? Okay, let's. I mean, what kind of how? That's what we need to do. Let's look at the success stories and then. Well, uh, how did that happen? Well, I think you know, you know, Trump became president and he didn't change, and so you know, he's a racist before he's a racist now, and so well, you know, folks got a chance to observe that. But you got them to the voting booth. What again? It's this sense of existential threat. He wants to go backwards in time. He wants to take all oh, yeah. of us, people of color and women and whomever, yeah. back to the 1950s, 40s, or wherever, right? And people are starting to realize that. Sure, but are they? And are they? Uh, I mean, did people get buses out to voters? Oh, how they, how they, yeah, how they, how they actually did it? Oh, you know what, Arlie? That is not my department. It's like <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just look at the numbers, uh, right? Uh, uh, but no, no, but no, but if you look at the ads, however, right? Yeah, okay. The ads yeah. for 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 Doug Jones, right? They they play. I mean, the, the fact that Roy right. Moore said that he thought the United States was a better place when black people were slaves. I mean, like, I mean, really? I mean, come on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. I know. And they lit up well, the airwaves with that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and he went to the polls on a horse when that, you know. So. Yeah, I thought that was funny. Was really oh, wait, let me, can somebody help me out? Who was the black man that was hanging out with Roy Moore? <laughs> Who was this guy, right? Yeah. They always seem to get some oh, random black person yeah, yeah. to stand in the oh, background. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> okay, let's go to this side now. It's a great success story, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, my name is John Bancroft, and uh, I, I, I know you weren't doing a, a uh, you were doing qualitative research, so you don't have statistics. But I wonder if you have any generalizations within the group you were studying between uh, men versus women, older versus younger, mm -hmm. more educated, less educated, or any other categories yeah. you want to yeah. speak on. Uh, okay, I'll answer, and then you would have a, a fuller one. But um, the uh, people I uh, interviewed weren't young, so they were, I was, I was trying to zero in on a core group or older. Um, but what was really interesting about the gender difference, they, in the end, um, fewer women voted for Trump uh, and voted in general than men, but they were generally um, uh, just as conservative, except there was kind of a hidden gender difference uh, when it came to welfare. I would ask them, well, I'd go to interview a couple, and uh, I asked them, is, well, how many people do you think are gaming the system? welfare system. Well, the guy would say, oh, 80%. Mm -hmm. And his wife would say, well, hey, but wait a minute. No, no, I think it's 15. You know, I was on welfare. I was a single mom. So uh, there were like these hidden gender gaps. Uh, uh, but it, yeah. And oh. education, uh, educational level? You know, Everybody, uh, half the people I interviewed uh, had college educations in local LSU, you know, uh, um, or community colleges, and the other half did not. Um, but everybody was first generation college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And very few books, you go into the home and they're just <laughs> very few books. So um, it, it sort of, began to think of education itself in a slightly different way. Um, and I wouldn't say I noticed a difference, you know, <laughs> by um, maybe more Manichaean types among the, uh, the most religious people that I met were high school educated. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No. Thanks. Yeah. Let's swing back over here to, the, to our right. How does your group relate to 
something that's bothered me, whether loyalty is more important than truth. Yeah. Uh, loyalty is more important than truth. I mean, loyalty you mean to the candidate or? Oh, I see. Right, right. If you're loyal to the Republican Party, that that comes before truth. Yeah, well, there's a lot of bending of the truth and not looking at the truth. And you know, when I went back after the book came out, and uh, uh, I, I wondered how they read the book because I have an appendix, <laughs> and in Appendix Three, it gives the truth. You know, based on labor force statistics from the Department of Labor, or the Bureau of the Census, and really they would say, oh, things like 30% uh, of all workers work for the federal government. It's 1.9, turns out, you know. <laughs> and then if you put state workers together, and, and that includes nurses and public hospitals, you put that in and you put, uh, uh, County workers, all of it only came to 15. So big, big differences. Um, and they, um, they live in a different truth and they are, they're all watching Fox News, almost <laughs> church-like as if it's, it is a church. And they will talk about, oh, Fox's family. And they, they have it worked out that uh, Riley is kind of daddy before he was <laughs> banished, <laughs> and uh, that Megyn Kelly was the sassy daughter, and that Hannity was the acerbic uncle. Really, like a family, you know, and... Wait, they actually said this to you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> If you hang out with them and you go fishing. I will uh, never find out, yeah. <laughs> well, you're lucky you have me. I'm I know. You, uh, Can you imagine if I'm trying to write the book yeah, you wrote? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think it would work out too well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Let's swing back over to our left. Um, a big part of your book, you talk about the deep story, you know, the line cutting thing. Wouldn't you say there's also deep stories, though, for the left that are really alienating for the right? Like, I think the big deep story for the left is, like, white racism, that, you know, all these problems are all rooted in white racism. And then that deep story is so alienating to a large majority of the white population that when they hear people like Limbaugh and Trump or whatever, they may not always be in agreement with them, but they're like, at least they're not blaming us for whatever, and that this deep story of the left is so alienating to such a large, when you have the majority of the population being kind of the, you know, the, the victim, you know, not the victim, you know, being, you know, the deep story on that side, how do you bridge that? And I just see that that deep story of the left is as alienating to the right as are that deep story on the other side. Well, good point. Um, I think I'm less actually sure uh, of it, but my picture of the deep story of the left is, is this. It's that we're all ranged around a public square and we are uh, looking at what's going on in it, and we see a state-of-the-art children's science museum, and we're proud of it. It's creative, it's available to all children. That's how the race thing comes in. All children, every race, every class. It's open night and day, and it's brilliant. And next to it are other public uh, sources of creativity, and uh, great public schools, great Childcare, a, 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 a beautiful park, we're conserving um, beautiful plants, and and we're proud of it. We're it isn't big government does everything, but it, it there is a commons. It's an incorporative Statue of Liberty model, um, and it's. Um, 
We pay taxes happily for that because we believe in a kind of public and corporative life. And uh, some of us have built that through nonprofits or volunteer activities. Anyway, another moment of the left progressive uh, deep story. In comes uh, a backhoe and it goes deep and it builds into the very foundation, the concrete of this state of the art children's science museum. And it uh, takes that concrete and out of the public sphere and builds a McMansion for the 1%, you know, um, in some gated community. And it feels like a theft, a theft of something that's incorporative and um, good uh, by a selfish 1%. We're furious at that. So race is part of a larger, I think, concept, a Statue of Liberty concept. I think that's our story. Okay, let's swing back to uh, our right. First of all, good evening, professors. Um, I have a question for you particularly. Two of your decisions interest me. And the first is your decision to forego using race as a keyhole issue. And the second is your decision to forego using a particularly racist narrative from one of your respondents within your book. So my question to you is, after seeing the results of the 2016 election in which uh, afterward, you know, this idea of cultural anxiety became very prominent and ultimately decided as, you know, the correct explanation for what happened. Do you feel as if those decisions denigrated or clouded what you conceived of as the deep story of the South? Well, before we continue, you neglected to say your name and where you go to school. <laughs> uh, my name is Nicole Buckley. I'm a student of Professor Parker's. I did not put her up for this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> Plant. <laughs> no, it's a great question. Um, I did write this uh, book uh, before Donald Trump was elected, mm -hmm. and um, and before race loomed large. You know, when it uh, uh, in in a way it has, um, and I was very scared, it feels to me still a miracle that I could do this, you know? And if I were to begin, hey, you racist, you know, I, I, there would be no conversation. So that's a pragmatism to, and I, this, you were asking why pick the environment? I thought, okay, there's a pragmatism to it, okay? This will be something that they'll see why I'm wondering why this isn't in their interest. So it's a kind of a pragmatic decision, but read the afterward to uh, the uh, paperback where I talk about uh, their response to Charlottesville, and deals with race. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, let's swing back over to our left. Um, my name's Tanya, and post-election, I wondered how did we turn out in our blue bubble the way we are, and they're in their red bubble, and they're their way and never the twain shall meet. Would there have been an opportunity at some point in any of your interviewees' lives that they could have been transported out of Louisiana and have grown up with a different world and they would not have ended up the way they are? I keep saying, please, can we have field trips to California and Washington, Western Washington, so that they can see what we're like. We're not, we're not monsters and was there, or as you get older, you're fixed in your ways and you can no longer make that transition or even understand. <laughs> I love it, I love what you're saying. You know, I feel like uh, we used to have institutional ways that mixed people of different regions and different races and different classes together. But now that voting so much reflects region, class, race, um, we need to make new ones. We used to have the compulsory draft. That Bingo. For men. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, First we, book. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we used to have uh, uh, strong labor unions that put, did this for workers and public schools, 
is the whole idea of that. Um, and now we're without that. So I think we need to create it. And in this afterward, uh, that's kind of my uh, call, to create for high schools a cross-regional uh, exchange program so that the South comes north for a month and is hosted by a family. North goes south. Coasts go inland. Inland goes to the coast. And you train students in civics, in history, and in uh, mediation skills, in active listening. Now, what, what is these people's deep story? How the, how's that go? Um, so you train them to be, um, and civics, the importance of respectful uh, discussion across big differences, that's, you train them in that. And then um, have them have, not, it's not enough to break bread together, you have to do something together. So I'd like to see solar, okay, you want, I may be dreaming here, but solar panels up and, um, uh, you know, houses uh, for the homeless and so on, have them be working on something together. So I think we need that structural shift. And I would add to it that um, we need to learn how a specific skill that I would call symbol stretching. It, you're talking about framing, which I think mm -hmm. is really key. But I met a man who was a brilliant symbol stretcher, framer, reframer. Uh, this was General Russell Honore. He was the hero who uh, rescued uh, the victims of uh, Katrina in New Orleans. He's now retired and a very active environmentalist. And I watched him talk to business people who didn't want to do anything about pollution. And here's what he would say. Say, well, I was looking out this morning at Lake Charles. Oh, by the way, businessman, freedom. That was the freedom. Freedom to have your own business, freedom to make a lot of money, freedom mm -hmm. uh, from mm -hmm. onerous regulation, mm -hmm. freedom people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's talking to them as an environmentalist. And he's saying, I saw a man out in the boat in Lake Charles this morning, and he had his fishing line out, he had his bucket ready, and he was... Uh, going to pull in a fish, but that man is not free to lift out an uncontaminated fish. Ah, I thought, you genius. <laughs> and I followed him around for two days just to hear how he talked. So simple stretching. You take an idea that they believe in, freedom, and you apply it to something that they don't apply it to. Yep. And you yep. just leave it like that, you yep. know? Um... So there's, I think we need to do that with patriotism. I yep. think the Democratic Party needs to do that. And say, look, you're patriotic, you, and they are. American flags everywhere. Oh my goodness, every mailbox, flag, flag, flag. So very patriotic. But when I asked them what it meant to be patriotic, oh, I would die for my country. And they mean it, you know. Okay, that's one thing, but what principles would you be dying for? That's another symbol stretch yep. that we haven't as a culture done. Yep. 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 And so I'd like to see us get out of our enclaves and enough to have, you know, it appeal to this larger kind of incorporative notion of nationalism. Yeah. In our calling card, could we all wear American flag lapel pins yep. made in America? Because you can find them on Amazon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So just a couple, uh, just let me, may I comment on a, a yeah. patriotism thing? So when we think about patriotism, like most people on the left, they don't like it and it's, they deride it most of the time. But if you think about what patriotism is, it's about a commitment to a set of values, right? So much so that you one would be willing in the case of military service to die, right? right? So, but when we think about American values, these are inherently progressive values. So if we're talking about a commitment to these inherently progressive values, why should the right take those over? They, they shouldn't, right? We, these are like, it's about a commitment to democracy, to uh, equality or equalitarianism, uh, tolerance, right? Freedom, right? When most oppressed groups think of freedom from oppression, right? But as Arlie said, you know, when it comes to businessmen or mainly white men, it's about freedom from government, right? 
So it's about, once again, it's about how we frame these things, it right? It is how we do it. Right. And so, and so the left needs to recapture patriotism. Why should we yes. cede it to the right? The That's right has right. had it since the 1950s. That's it's right. time for us to take it back. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm also a graduate of UW Political Science. <laughs> John Wilkerson was my uh, ah, okay. committee chair. But yeah, okay. I, I now teach at Bellevue College, Political okay. Science. And my question is sort of a pedagogical question, but also about civic education. Um, and I don't know if you've experienced this with your students, but since Trump's election, there's been a lot more permission for students to say mm -hmm. distasteful mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I also have a belief in education and a mm -hmm. free exchange of ideas. Uh, so I'm wondering, how do you, in your classroom settings or with students, deal with when people are saying those kinds of things that sort of go against the norms that we want to establish in our classroom or in our society, but still allow for some pushback, right? Right. So what do you I, do? Wow, great question. Uh, I'll answer, but then you too. I think uh, you establish at the real beginning that um, one thing they're going to learn in this class is how to listen uh, and how to speak respectfully respectfully so that they understand uh, how their words are heard and that this is a skill in any civic culture that's associated with national mm -hmm. <laughs> pride and patriotism. Mm -hmm. I'd start with early framing and then keep, keep them to it. What would you do? <laughs> yeah, I, I would say the same thing is that, you know, you can't, you know, everybody has their particular viewpoints as long as they express them you know, with some respect, and they're not, right. they're not calling people out of their names, right? I mean, I get tired of playing the conservative in class. I'm glad we have some conservative kids in our class that want to speak up. So as long as the discourse is respectful, then, you know, it's yes. about the marketplace of ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. So we have our last question of the night here on our left. Hi, my name is uh, Jeremy, and um, hopefully I'll say this uh, peacefully and respectfully. Um, I just wanted to ask, actually, where does peace and love come into all of this? Oh, wonderful. Well, uh, I think uh, in strangers in their own land, it's kind of a foundation of it, actually. I was trying to appeal to their better angels, and I actually believe you may have a little difference on this, but I think that's a powerful thing to do politically, mm -hmm. uh, and that that's what Reverend Barber is, is, is doing. Um, so, um, yeah, and wouldn't you say that we're, in a way, having a conversation this evening about how peacefully and lovingly to cope with a... Uh, a president who is not peaceful or loving. We're, we're in the hands of a leader who may get us into a nuclear war and who is Mr. Yesterday with regard to uh, every social code. So, um, but I think we're advocating doing this in a peace peaceful, loving way, insofar as we can. Mm -hmm. And there may be limits to that. <laughs> yeah. you. You're welcome. I'll just, I'll just to, well, I'll quote Marvin Gaye on this, only love can conquer hate. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or only love can conquer hate. Yeah. So I do, I do think, I do think there's, uh, there's room for this, um, but we need um, people like Arlie to be able to do that because I, I know we all don't have that um, empathic capacity that she has to talk to people with whom we violently disagree. I mean, I think... Uh, I mean, I think, I, think, I think that is a splendid quality you have, and, and you know, hopefully we'll be reading more of your work in the near future. So let's thank, thank you. Thank you.